In this brief lecture, I'm going to give you an overview of the main characteristics of English academic discourse, with particular reference to some of the, pro the problems faced by Portuguese learners. I'd like to begin by defining these terms, as they're inherently problematic for speakers of Portuguese and the other Romance languages. For a start, unless you're a linguist, the word discurso probably suggests to you an oral monologue of a formal nature, such as the kind that politicians or other important dignitaries make on ceremonial occasions. That is not the meaning used here. The word academical, for its part, does not collocate very well with discurso in Portuguese. In recent years, it has become increasingly commonplace to hear of discurso científico, which does indeed broadly correspond to the entity that we're dealing with here. However, you need to be careful. The word científico is a false friend or false cognate with English because it excludes scholarship conducted in the humanities, arts or social sciences. It refers broadly to the language that is used in academic settings. That's to say in universities, research centres and the various bodies that exist to disseminate the results of research which means that it has certain characteristics that mark it out from the kind of language that is used in the street. It may be oral, as in the case of a lecture or conference paper, or it may be written, and it covers all disciplines and academic genres. This means that it's an umbrella term that encompasses many sub-discourses, such as the discourses of physics, for example, or linguistics, or economics. It also has significant overlaps with other major discourses, such as the discourses of business, public administration or journalism. Modern academic discourse in English is the descendant of a discourse that was forged back in the 17th century by the scientists of the Royal Academy in the context of the major epistemological upheaval that has come to be known as the scientific revolution. Their objective was to shift the focus away from the study of texts to the, the things of the outside world. Think things, not words, as Francis Bacon uh, famously said. Thus, for them, the main function of language was to tr transmit information about that external reality as effectively as possible. From this perspective then, it made sense that language should be as clear and as straightforward as possible, so as to offer a transparent window onto the object of study. Hence, these early scientists rejected the grand style of rhetoric, beloved of the scholastics and the humanists of the age, and instead advocated a plain style that used down-to-earth terms and structures that the common man might easily understand. It was also desirable to be as economical as possible with language, saying what was required in as few words as possible. In order to achieve this without sacrificing clarity, it was necessary to be as precise as possible, using clearly defined terms that would not generate any ambiguity. These three qualities, clarity, economy and precision, remain the most important characteristics of mainstream academic discourse today. As these early scientists believed that the world they were studying existed independently of human perception, it also made sense to try to eliminate all traces of subjectivity from this new discourse, so as not to compromise the universality of their claims. This meant avoiding figurative and emotive language and anything with a purely aesthetic function. Indeed, over the course of the next three or four hundred years or so, um, grammatical features developed, such as nominalizations, the agentless passive, that effect effectively shifted the focus of attention away from the human observer and onto the object of study. This resulted in a discourse that was, above all, objective 
and impersonal. This new scientific discourse and the theory of knowledge that it encoded, known as empiricism, gradually acquired prestige in the Anglo-Saxon world due to their associations with technology, industry and capitalism. And as a result, the older rhetorical tradition fell out of fashion. Today, in the words of linguist Jim Martin, there is an essential continuity between the humanities and science as far as interpreting the world is concerned. That is to say, all mainstream academic writing in English, and I'm not including here the counter-hegemonic discourses that developed at the end of the 20th century through the influence of post-structuralism, all mainstream academic writing in English is based on the same principles. This was borne out by a survey of the various academic style manuals on the market, which I conducted a few years ago. I found that, irrespective of whether they were aimed at scientists, social scientists, or humanists, or even literary scholars, these style manuals all gave much the same advice. Indeed, the only significant difference that I found was a greater tolerance of subjectivity in the humanistic and some social science disciplines, reflecting their less positivistic orientation to knowledge. In other respects, as regards text organisation, persuasive strategies, sentence length and basic diction, they're all basically saying the same thing. Well, if you're a scientist, you won't have too many problems. Portuguese scientific discourse is essentially calced upon English, which means that it's organised according to the same basic principles. Hence, the only difficulties you are likely to encounter are minor issues, such as word order in nominalisations and sentences caused by interference from Portuguese language. For humanities and arts scholars, however, the problems are of a whole different order of magnitude. Humanistic writing in Portuguese and the other Romance languages is based on a whole different theory of knowledge to that underpinning English academic discourse. It cultivates qualities that are, to a large extent, diametrically opposed to those valued in English, such as verbal complexity, emotivity and high-flown erudite diction. And this makes it extremely difficult for Portuguese humanities scholars to write English convincingly. As for the social sciences, well, these tend to be rather schizophrenic, torn between scientific and humanistic approaches. Consequently, if you are a psychologist, sociologist, anthropologist, or even a geographer, you need to be very clear in your own mind as to which paradigm you're working within, because this will affect your style in English. Thank you very much for your attention. If you are interested in any of the historical or cultural or philosophical issues raised in this lecture, you can find references for further reading in the bibliography. As regards the characteristics of English academic discourse, there is a summary of these in reference file one.